Our next case is Mr. Johnny O'Neill. Are you Mr. O'Neill? I am, sir. Mr. O'Neill, would you give us your full name and DLC number, please? My name is Johnny O'Neill, 523280. Mr. O'Neill, uh, I'm going to read some information into the record, then we're going to, we're going to conduct a pardon interview with you. And at the appropriate time, those persons who've indicated they wish to speak will have some input. Uh, here today on your behalf, I believe on Zoom, is Kathy O'Neill and Billy O'Neill, uh, your sister and brother. They don't want to speak, but they're here to support you. Uh, we do have uh, two people uh, in opposition, Ms. Gertrude Thomas and Ms. Betty Wilson, who will be speaking. Once we have the hearing, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to the board, and then we'll vote. You understand our procedure, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, this is uh, Johnny O'Neill, 523280, date of birth, July the 3rd of 1967. He's a first time offender. He's serving a life sentence on the charge of second degree murder, having been sentenced on May 7th of 2007. Uh, Mr. Uh, O'Neill, is all of that accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. O'Neill, your case was signed, assigned to me, so uh, I'll begin our uh, interview with you. Mr. O'Neill, how old are you, sir? 55. How long have you been in prison on these charges? 17 and a half years. And uh, you were charged with uh, second degree murder. You were tried and convicted of second degree murder. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, sir. That was a jury trial or a judge trial? Jury trial. Uh, tell me in your own words, what happened back in December the 23rd, 2005? Well, um, I had just come from Walmart, uh, picking up some uh, food for my dogs. And I drove up and went in the house and checked on the business. We had a business and I was checking the sales, uh, the internet sales to see what was, did we have anything on there. And then I heard a dog outside that bark, uh, and it was my dog outside barking. And I looked out the window and it was a big pit bull that was in my yard. I called the dog pound uh, about the dog to see if they can come send someone out. And they was telling me that it'll probably be an hour or so before they could get out. Um, I wind up having to make another call because the dog was still uh, threatening uh, my dogs. And and the uh, uh, attendant told me that uh, she needed someone to find out which way the dog went. And I told her, you know, I was kind of busy at the time, but she said, you know, the dog may wind up hurting someone. So that's what made me go outdoors that evening. And I go, I'll go outside. Mr. O'Neill, I didn't see any of that in the police report about the pit bull. Uh, I know that's your story that you're saying in your application, but there was nothing in the police report whatsoever back at the time about a pit bull. Why is that? Uh, the police report, you're saying there's nothing in the police report about the pit bull? Right. Uh, I do not know what they just didn't put it in there, I guess. I don't know, sir. Uh, uh, at the tell, time, me, tell me how it is you ended up shooting uh, Mr. Calvin Moore six times. I came outside and I looked to the right um, because uh, when she told me to come outside to look for the pit, I come outside, I look to the right. Uh, I got a neighbor stayed up, Mr. Uh, uh, at 252 East Herndon. Uh, I asked him, did he see the direction of the pit bull? He says no. And so I looked around and I don't see the, the pit bull. And I goes over, I hear uh, something over in the yard and I see Mr. Moore over here cutting the yard. And I goes over and asking him the same thing. Did he see the direction of the pit bull? Um, at that time, uh, I heard something like a crack or something fell at the back back here. And when I turned to look at it, I was asking Mr. Moore about it. And while Mr. Moore was cutting, he was had started to cut up in the yard, which was no problem. I just put some rye grass down. I just simply asked him, you know, if you can just, you know, cut on the sidewalk part and not that. By me looking back, that took my eyes off what uh, was in front of me. And that's when Mr. Moore, you know, he started to curse. And, um, and as I turned back, you know, I, my foot slipped on the, the leaves. 
And, you know, the, the lawnmower was coming at me. And that's when I wind up, you know, pulling the gun out and wind up uh, shooting Mr. Moore. Well, that's probably the third or fourth story that you told. So tell me how you pulled the gun out, because one of your stories was you slipped down, uh, your, your gun got caught in your pants and it started firing. So what, what did you do? I mean, what happened? Why did you shoot the man? Because he was cutting his grass. No, he was in my yard, sir. And what happened is at that time, I got a lot of leaves that done fell out of an oak tree that I got in my yard. And my yard has a, a incline to it. And right at the top of that incline, that's where I'm standing there. And there's a lot of leaves there. So as Mr. Moore is pushing up, now, uh, as he begins to uh, push the moor at me, and that's when I wind up uh, having to pull the gun to try to uh, So stop he him. had a lawnmower and you had a gun and you thought he was coming at you, so you shot him six times? Well, what happens is I didn't go out there to do nothing to Mr. Moore. Well, but, him, but you did. So tell me what you did while you were out there. Well, I was out there, like I said, to look for the pit bull. I heard all of that. I yeah. want to know why you shot him because he was cutting your yard and he looked like he might be pushing towards you. Well, he was coming at me, sir. And while I'm standing at the, the top of the hill, you know, by me looking back, that's what distracted me. And so when I look back, that's when I see the lawnmower and as he's cussing me and telling and threatening. That's when he's, I see the lawnmower uh, coming up on me. He has Mr. Mr. O'Neill, did you testify at your own trial and tell the jury this story? I didn't get a chance to. What do you mean you didn't get a chance to? Uh, me and the public defender, we talked about it, but then when the DA rested, um, the public defender got up and rested also, sir. Well, I mean, uh, he discussed that with you, I'm sure. You didn't tell him, I want to get up and tell my side of the story? Yes, sir, I did. So you never told the, the police anything about a pit bull. Uh, what was the relationship with you and Mr. Moore? Uh, Mr. Moore was a- uh, that y'all had a lot of problems. You would report him for all kinds of things that were going on in your yard. Well, that actually, well actually, sir, uh, Mr. Moore had uh, Mr. Connor that stayed with him. Mr. Moore, like me, uh, worked. Uh, Mr. Connor, was the one Did you and Mr. Moore have a fairly acrimonious uh, relationship? You, you yeah. didn't get along very well, is that fair to say? Sir, we got along very well. Uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, he was the one that looked out to my house when I would go to work. I had my own business. Uh, me and Mr. Moore didn't have no problems in the sense that we was uh, beefing or anything. He would have Mr. Connor that stayed there who would play loud music late at night. So by but it was Mr. Had, Moore with the lawnmower that you shot. He's your friend now. He no, was, didn't have any problems? You didn't have any issues with Mr. Moore? Only problem we had with Mr. Moore was the music that was played loud by Mr. Connor that was staying there. And a few times that, you know, we had beer bottles that were thrown in our yard and stuff like that, that we had to uh, report and stuff like that. I didn't, I'm not no angry person where I'm going. Well, let, let me ask you this. Why did you tell the police you slipped down and your gun just went off? Because Why did you tell them that? When I'm on the, the, on the top of the hill, what's happening is by me having so many leaves there, I didn't get a chance to get the leaves out the yard. I mean, they just fell. So by me seeing the lawnmower, he's raising it and get about to lower the lawnmower and I see the blades. That's what made me now I was trying to get out from up under it. And by me trying to hurry up and move, that's when my right foot slips up out from under me. And I can't get out from up under it. And so that's when I wind up pulling the gun, trying to uh, stop him from lowering the blades down and wind up cutting me up, and, uh, which is what he was saying, you know. Mr. O'Neill, how about drugs or alcohol? Do you use drugs or alcohol? Did you use drugs or alcohol back then? I've never used drugs uh, in my life. Uh, only time I drunk when I was back as a teenager, probably 18, 19. So you weren't drinking on this particular day? No, sir. So 
what what sort of uh, programs have you taken while you've been in prison that have helped you while you've been there? Uh, one of the things that I talk about that, uh, you know, I've been blessed to be a part of is faith-based, uh, which allows me to uh, uh, learn about what causes anger and the triggers of anger. And in doing so, you know, I've been blessed also to be able to teach others uh, about uh, anger and how uh, to prevent anger and the consequences of anger. So faith-based been one of the greatest tools that I've uh, had a chance to listen and, and sit up under and grow up under and uh, help me change. Yes. Is it, is it fair to say since, since you believe one of the most significant things that you've learned while you've been in there is to control your anger, uh, did you have an anger issue before you came to prison? Uh, I didn't have what you call a, a anger issue, but uh, it helps me to understand the difference in um, when you're upset, when you're angry about something, how to be able to handle it. The reason I chose anger because I get a chance to minister to a lot of dudes, a lot of men who are. And, um, and it also allowed me to see myself uh, just what when I say anger, I'm talking about emotions. So having a chance to see the different emotions and uh, the class on dysfunction, the class on um, uh, uh, anger management. The reason I brought up anger because of anger management um, and other classes that I took, you know, experiencing God, that allowed me to see, um, you know, the person that I was and that I could be a better person. And that's why I talk about faith-based and right. you know so Neil, you, you've got uh opposition from law enforcement you have opposition from the family of the victim uh you've got a pretty good uh disciplinary record you've only had two write-ups your last one was in 2016 you've got a number of letters of support yes, uh you're classified as as a low risk uh you know, I, I I I guess my concern, and I want to I want to be very frank with you, is I just don't think you're being honest about what happened. Uh, I I think that a jury found you guilty of second degree murder. I mean, what you're describing certainly is not second degree murder. Uh, so I just don't think you're taking responsibility for what you did. Uh, you've only been in prison for 17 and a half years. Uh, you indicated one of the main things that you learned while you've been in there is to control your anger, but anger wasn't an issue, you say. So how have you changed? Are you different than you were when you came into prison, or are you the same? I am different, sir, because um, uh, one of the classes that I take is like thinking for a change. And, you know, I take full responsibility for my actions that day. Well, what was your actions and why do you take full responsibility for it? If the man was trying to run over you with a lawnmower and you thought you were trying to protect yourself. I take full responsibility, sir, for my part that I played because um, maybe if I would have uh, uh, been able to keep my foot, uh, maybe, you know, I could have did something different. You know, I've looked at this uh, uh, every night and day since I've been here. Um, the thing that you asked me that what have I changed and that is to try to make sure that I don't get in a situation like that. Uh, and also to know that um, that when I'm in a situation like that, just trying to figure out another way to come out of that situation. I mean, so um, that's the thing I and yes, sir, that I have had a chance to change because uh, the person that came here uh, that 18 years ago, uh, I was still in a process, you know, with a business and all of this here. And I understand that a lot of times, like I share with, with my family, uh, I put a lot of things in front of them and 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 those are the things that I regret. So, uh, like I said, I take the responsibility for what I have done. And well, I hear you say that, but, but I don't see you admitting that you've done anything. You said you slipped. Uh, if you could change things, you say, well, I, 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 I hope I wouldn't have slipped, you know? Uh, I hear you. Uh, Warden, what can you tell us about Mr. Uh, O'Neill? Um, I can tell you that Mr. O'Neill is a minimum, uh, minimum anger management. Uh, he's a minimum anger management. Uh, he's a minimum anger management. 
a trustee. He's a minister. He has a BA in Christian ministry, and he also is a healthcare audit trainee. So he also uh, goes in and help with the uh, the the um, medical offenders in Ash Four. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions. Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now we'll hear from. Uh, All right, now we'll hear from uh, Miss Gertrude Thomas, who is the victim's sister. Miss Thomas, uh, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Uh, if you would introduce yourself, please, and tell us what you'd like us to know. My name is Gertrude Thomas, and I am Calvin Moore's sister. Um, I am definitely opposed to Mr. O'Neill being pardoned. Uh, he took a life. He took the life of our baby brother, a wonderful soul. Um, he took away an uncle that was very, very kind to all of all of his nieces and nephews. Um, I think it would be a great, great disappointment if they were to pardon him because I really don't think he's changed. He started off with a lie, the very first thing. Um, I had so many things to say, but, um, They've really slipped my mind right now because I'm very disappointed that he has not changed. He does not seem to have changed. His story has changed so many times. You know, each time I've heard or read what he said, it's been different. So I, I'm really in opposition to him being pardoned. And I, I pray that you guys grant that. Thank you very much, Ms. Thomas. We appreciate yeah. your comments. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, how are you? Hello. I'm well today, thank you. If you would please introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to hear. My name is Betty Moore, Betty Moore Wilson. And today I come on behalf of Calvin's family. Um, I did present my position statement in regards to my reasons as to why I think this commutation should not be granted. I say that for many reasons, but my heart is so heavy today and I hear the story today in regards to Johnny O'Neill stating that he took a life because he slipped. He took a life because of my brother who was an outstanding citizen in the community, who was known well in the community, helping others, family man, um, someone who would do anything for anyone. And I hear the story that relates back to you, the story that has followed me and has followed others as you hear of the story of the murder and the lawnmower. That is how it's referenced. And that story is a story to when I was traveling into Louisiana from out of state, stopping at a local gas station and saw on the front cover of a local newspaper, the story in regards to my brother being murdered. The story that has forever resonated in my soul, the story that I knew something that day was totally not right. As I had been with my family two days before, and this was around the Christmas season. As I mentioned, Kevin, being a family man, we met as I was traveling. To visit my family, we stopped in Texas. We had a beautiful time. The next two days, Calvin would host our family for Christmas. That didn't happen. At the hands of Mr. O'Neill, he took that. He took everything from us that meant everything to us. This was heart-wrenching. This was part of me that left me, and I can never go back and claim all the things that was so essential to me and my family. This was my playmate as a child. This was my soulmate. 
This was my other half of me. This was my brother. This was my children's uncle. This was my brother. This was a family member. When I sit here today and hear Johnny O'Neill's story, it tears me down. It breaks me down. I visited Calvin many a time. Many a times. Knowing that we was a family, knowing the story that Mr. O'Neill possesses about Calvin bringing harm, or doing anything with Lawnmower, and when he had a gun and he shot him six times, six times, not once, six times. I recall the day when my soul just was not right the whole day when I just could not feel the uplift, the heaviness that was on me. When later that night, I received the tragic news, I immediately sat up in bed and said, something's wrong. I had to make the drive from Alabama to Louisiana. That tore me down. I had to plan abuse over Christmas. The day we left this, I asked that this board, I prayed that this board not request a computation on behalf of Calvin's family, on behalf of doing what's right. And Mr. O'Neill, I say to you today, search your heart, search your heart, and know that you took away a good man. You took away a man, a citizen, outstanding person, and community who we can never get back. My baby brother, someone outstanding in the community. I wish you no know good at this point, and no good that you, we get a commutation today. Sit and think about what you have done to this family. You Mr. tore us down. Just, just direct the board, please, and it's Thank time you. to wrap up. We need to you. understand your position. Thank you very much. Mr. O'Neill, is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes? Yes, sir. I would just like to say that, um, uh, like I was saying, sir, um, I was not angry with Mr. Moore. Uh, we was we got along very good, like I said, and um, what I just shared today, that's what happened. Um, I'm not a person to go around just being violent. Um, you know, I regret what happened. Um, you know, but like I said, I didn't go out there that night to do Mr. Moore anything then. You know, I'm not a danger to society then. I wasn't a danger to society now. I think the record showed that, you know, I was had my own business out there on the street, in church, getting ready to go to church uh, that weekend for Christmas celebration. Uh, even here, you know, the Lord have blessed me to be able to uh, uh, help people. The same thing I was doing on the street, basically. Uh, but like I said, just I learned a little bit more about uh, uh, about who I am and, and, and how to be able to help more people and then help my myself and you know like I said I apologize uh, I uh, just you know hope the board can can know that you know I'm not perfect I wasn't perfect uh, I there's nothing inside of me that's about hurting people at all you know I had no intention of, of trying to hurt Mr. Moore that was not something it's just something uh, that so uh, with that, you know, uh, you know, with the shame I brought on my family with this, my part in this, the hurt I've caused, I mean, that's something that I deal with since I've been here. And uh, the only way I have known to be able to uh, rectify that is by trying to help other people not come here and those that are here not to uh, uh, commit uh, violence, crimes of violence. You know, so with that, you know, I would just like to say thank, thank the board and no. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Appreciate your comments. The board ready to vote? Yes. 
Mr. O'Neill, uh, you know, you've done well while you've been in prison. You've done some, uh, you know, your disciplinary record is good. Are you a low risk? Uh, you take some faith faith-based programs. I'd like to see you take some more programs. Uh, the real problem I've got is, is you just don't accept responsibility for what you did. I mean, your story has changed time after time after time. I, I've, I've seen two and three different stories uh, throughout your police report. Uh, a jury heard all of the evidence, they heard everything that happened on that particular day, and they found you guilty of second degree murder. You say you apologize, you take full responsibility, but you've taken no responsibility. You say you slipped and it was an accident and you're sorry. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I think you need some more time to reflect on, uh, on what you did and why you did it. Uh, perhaps it was you were angry, uh, but you shot this man six times. And uh, for me, uh, I just can't vote uh, to recommend a pardon, especially since you've only served about 17 years in prison on a second degree murder charge. So based upon all of those things, my vote, the victim opposition, law enforcement opposition, my vote would be to deny. Ms. Jackson? My vote is the same, uh, Mr. O'Neill, for the same reason. Mr. Rorschach? Uh, Mr. O'Neill, based upon insufficient time served, Opposition for the legal community, victim opposition, and primarily a lack of responsibility for your actions. I deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Bush. And Mr. Freeman? I concur with everything that was said. Mr. O'Neill, uh, you've got four votes to deny. Uh, I hope you continue to work hard while you're in prison. I hope you start working on yourself. Uh, to, to kind of come to some realization of what really happened out there that night so you can accept that. Okay. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think we're finished at uh, Angola. Warden, thank you very much. Uh, you. Enjoy your evening. Uh, time is 5.33. Thank you, sir. So you can accept that. Yeah, so we're going to unpack this, and we do have the court transcript that we'll go over to find out what really happened, but if you want to hear a man in denial, this is it. I wouldn't even, denial is not the right word, right? It's, it's bizarre. It's like we see all different types of I think you might describe a man like this as just a full-blown narcissist. I he uh, even in his final speech, I have no intention of harming Mr. Moore. This is like out of those shows, Neighbors That Kill, I think. He's, in, he's like totally oblivious to how other people perceive him. He actually thought he can get up in front of the board. And he starts off with serious gaslighting. It's a story about pit bulls. And you're waiting for the story to unravel about the pit bulls. But it, it, it was pure gaslight. You know, if he had gone out and I and said, you know, it's it's he he didn't get along with his neighbor. It was piling up, piling up, piling up, and then really, December twenty third, two days before Christmas, at about six p.m., I, I did some googling. the The sun sets at five p.m. on December twenty third, so it's nighttime. It's December twenty third. And, you know, your neighbor comes out and starts mowing the lawn. And he's pissed off. Because who the hell mows their lawn at, at, at dark? Uh, and he's angry. And he goes out. And he unloads his weapon on him. And I'm not saying that's an excuse. 
And I'm not saying that he ever should be free again because he's obviously a dangerous man. But that's my guess as to what happened. It was a boiling point. He lost it. But then he goes up on these stories... with that are just so absurd and mr mirabella i love that he was interviewing him because he's just like you know he's just handling it so perfectly well he's like why do you have to apologize if you did anything wrong you, you fell on a pile of grass and then and he starts mumbling with his with his like response. I have not done that. And you know, it's this poor criminal in Angola that he he bought a weapon that just sh shot six times by itself. I mean, it just it keeps on happening. You know, we really need to do an investigation into all of these weapons that just have a mind of their own. I mean, this one, this is a whole new level of crazy. I mean, he actually, like, um, <laughs> you know, there are people that say the weapon went off one time by itself. We've seen somehow two times, but six. And I think this was a revolver, too. <laughs> it's just so bizarre. It's so dumb. Yeah, no wonder his attorney didn't want him to get on the stand. He's he and he, you know, he wanted to get on the stand. He's like, well, I spoke to him about my attorney, but uh, when they had their closing arguments, that was it. Yeah, your your attorney was protecting you because if you, sir, had gone on that stand. You might have had an appeal on uh, on the grounds of ineff inefficient counsel. Is that what, it's, what it is? For allowing you to go on the stand. Because, man, that would have been just, whew. This is all these years later, and he still doesn't even, he still hasn't had the time to try to formulate some type of, well, he did. He, he was going on about pit bulls. I bet he had it all perfectly planned in his head. And once it was cut off, it was derailed, and he just reverted back to he, he, he all of his different stories. He just he he just lost track of his train of thought, and it went to well, I I he was coming at me with the lawnmower. Then you know I I thought he was going to attack me with the lawnmower, and then in in the same you know, a minute later, it's. I actually, I, I fell down on, on the grass. Some people truly do be belong locked up for their whole lives. And it does make you wonder how someone can go his whole life without, uh, my understanding, any record. This was his first felony how do you go your whole life and then all of a sudden snap and you don't just snap because like i said you know you can kind of see people snapping but you see him now and you just wonder why something didn't happen sooner in his life he, he just doesn't seem to be aware forget remorse it's like there's something missing there's no empathy there's no there's no awareness of how other people perceive you and what you're saying let's go look at the court doc his appeal Do, 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 do. 
Facts. During the early evening hours of December 23rd, 2005, you imagine two days before Christmas, you know, everyone's kind of just chilling. What day of the week was it? What day of the week? Day of the week. Louisiana, December 3rd, 2005. I want to visualize the full picture here. It was a Friday. I mean, it is pretty insensitive to mow your grass Friday at 6 p.m. after sunset on December 23rd. But again, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, um, I don't know, you tell me, if I had a neighbor that was doing that, I, and, and you can imagine they, that, you know, they probably bumped heads for a long time about that dumb lawnmower. And... Uh, but uh, don't take me wrong. I am not giving you, him any, like, there's no empathy here. This man belongs locked up in prison. And um, But, okay, so December 23rd, 2005, 43-year-old Calvin Moore began mowing the lawn of his house. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people do mow their lawn. I don't know. You tell me. Uh, on a Friday night at six o'clock. Um, and Tony Randall, who lived next door to O'Neill, so he's a witness. Uh, Randall was standing in his front yard and saw Moore mowing his lawn and noticed O'Neill walking towards Moore. Randall testified that he could hear Moore telling O'Neill to get out of my face, but he could not hear what O'Neill was saying. Randall explained that he stepped behind the car in his driveway, sensing something was about to happen. And then he heard Moore say, man, get the hell away from me. Get the hell away from me. Randall then heard eight or nine shots and took off running inside his house from where he heard more shots. Randall did not have a, oh, because Randall did not have a telephone. Wow. Who? You don't have a telephone. Wow. I don't know. I guess this is 2005. A lot of people didn't have, really have cell phones. Well, not as many had cell phones. This was like two years before the iPhone was invented. But I remember my BlackBerry. I loved my BlackBerry. Did you? Did you have one? The BBM. Wow. BBM was so cool. And also this, I guess this could be up in like like more like country land, like rural Louisiana, maybe. I don't know, but still not having a phone. That should be nice life to not have a phone. Peaceful. He drove around the block to use someone else's telephone. By this time, he saw police driving towards the scene. Around the same time, Huey Pickard was stopped at a stop sign while on his way to his mother's house when he noticed Moore down the street mowing his lawn. Here's another witness. Pickard looked down for a moment but looked up when he heard shots fired. Pickard testified that when he saw, when he looked up, he saw a man, O'Neill. He was. After the shooting, O'Neill went inside the house and called 911 alleging that he was standing in front of his yard. Um, alleging that he was standing in front of his yard with his next door neighbor had tried to run him over with his lawnmower. So that was his first story. So he called, he called 911 and said that his neighbor tried running him over with a lawnmower. Approximately 6 p.m., Sheriff Port Police Officer Corley Lovett was dispatched to O'Neill's residence in response to the 911 call.
The officer Levitt testified that O'Neill told him that Moore continued cutting the grass on O'Neill's property after he asked Moore to stop and that he had been an ongoing problem with Moore. O'Neill explained to the officer Levitt that when he asked Moore to stop cutting the grass, Moore came at him with the lawnmower with the blades up. O'Neill then told the officer Levitt that he pulled out his weapon and, sh and, and yeah, and shot at Moore. Officer Levitt testified that this was the first time he heard that there was a shooting involved. Officer Levitt asked O'Neill if he actually shot Moore, and O'Neill said he didn't know. At this time, Officer Levitt went to Moore's home to check up on him, but no one answered. In the meantime, another neighbor, Sean, had called 911 to report a man was lying down in the middle of the street. That's so interesting. It's, it's like a police officer shows up to the call, is knocking on the door, and meanwhile, the guy's bleeding out on the street. That's... The Sheriff Port Fire Department was dispatched to check on the man's condition. Just at, after Officer Levette rang Moore's doorbell, he heard sirens and observed the fire department arriving at the scene. How did he not? I guess it was dark, so he just didn't. He didn't see him. Officer Levette then saw Moore lying in the grass. Moore's found 10 to 15 yards away from the lawnmower in the driveway. If you can imagine the eerie scene, he shows up to the man's house who called 911. That man says he fired at him because he was afraid for his life. But meanwhile, he's lying on the grass bleeding out. The police officer doesn't even know. And he only looks there and he, after he hears the fire truck coming. O'Neill indicated that he understood his Miranda rights. Officer Levitt asked O'Neill about the weapon. O'Neill indicated that it was on the shelf in his room. After obtaining permission to go in the house, Levitt found it. Um, O'Neill, was in the while he was in the back of the police car, he told Detective James Cromer that Moore had attempted to attack him with the lawnmower and that Moore had the lawnmower up with the blades showing. O'Neill told Detectives Cromer that he fired at least five times before going inside where he reloaded because he was afraid that more might come back and shoot him. More ultimately died as a result of multiple wounds. O'Neill was uh, indicted and convicted by unanimous jury for a second degree. The trial court sentenced him to mandatory life without parole. And remember, this this is not a parole hearing. This that we just saw. It's a commutation hearing. So, if the board had, for some reason, approved him, the governor would have had to have signed off. And frankly, this man just doesn't belong to be free, in my opinion. Ever, he's just. And even if he had come out and said, "Hey, I had just lost it." The man keeps coming out and cutting his grass at night. I ask him nicely. And, you know, you can see a situation where that happens, where your neighbor just disrespects, like, those basic, I think, are laws of what it is like to be neighborly. And maybe year after year, day after weekend after week, you just lose it. Um, not saying that that, <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not giving an excuse, but it's something. But he, he comes out here and just... Uh, has no insight. I mean, he actually thinks that that is, it's like a lawnmower, dude. The state presented two eyewitnesses who did not see Moore chasing O'Neill with the lawnmower. Tony Randall, an auto mechanic, testified that he did not hear the lawnmower running um, at Moore in a heated exchange, and that Moore had positioned the lawnmower away from O'Neill. Huey Picker testified that the two men were facing each other when the shooting began. 
O'Neill turned to run after the shooting. Pickard also testified that the following that both men were standing up straight. The lawnmower was just sitting there during the exchange. I wonder what kind of lawnmower it was with the blade showing. I mean, is it an electric lawnmower? I mean, is it... Not electric gas power, you know, like you would pick it up, like the little... It just seems so... O'Neill argues that the witnesses were not credible because the website, the website shows that it would have been dark at the time. He did not offer any evidence contradicting the witness who testified uh, that there was enough light to see what was happening. Randall testified that it was getting dark and the light was from someone's house. Picker testified that it was late in the evening, but there was still some daylight. And imagine it was December 23rd. There could have been Christmas decorations up. It doesn't... That time of year, it's like 50 degrees or something. So it's not like a cold Christmas night, you know? It could be 60s too. According to Google, the state demonstrated the jury how the lawnmower would have been positioned in order to expose the blades, how plausible it was for Moore to have chased O'Neill. It appeared that someone had just started mowing because the, neither yard appeared to have been mowed. Oh, here's here's interesting. While Moore and O'Neill had past disputes regarding loud noise and property lines, there was no evidence of violence between them or any other evidence to indicate O'Neill had any reason to fear Moore. Thus, considering the totality of the circumstance, the state presented sufficient evidence from which a reasonable jury could determine that O'Neill had no reasonable belief that he was in imminent danger. Certain people shouldn't own weapons. And uh, he's one of them because it just got him in trouble. And I, I'm a big uh, Second Amendment guy, but for their own sake, man, if you have a temper... You just shouldn't own one. The odds are stacked against you. Sudden passion, heat of blood, or mitigating factors. Um... You might say that, except that you you maybe could have had that argument, except that you uh, you just made up all these ridiculous stories. Provocation is sufficient to deprive an average person of self-control. The defendant is not obliged to establish factors. Um, Provocation shall not reduce homicide. Man, I'm just looking at all this stuff. It's interesting, but. Oh, it wasn't a revolver. It was a 45 semi-automatic. But it was unfortunate um, that it was a 45 semi-automatic that shoots six times by itself. It's crazy I'm telling you these these uh people that sell these these weapons should get prosecuted not the not the guy who falls down on a pile of grass you know he'd been shot twice in the back coward he was running away and he was continuing to shoot at him he went back to reload We are confident that a reasonable person would not lose his cool and kill over whether a neighbor mowed a small area of his lawn. O'Neill did not meet his burden of proving that he killed more while acting in sudden passion. 
blood, and thus he was not entitled to verdict. Here th th in court, the example, would you be able to make the lawnmower look like you were pushing it at the person? You know, he, he really is so, he's really, you know, in court, he made the full argument that he was in fear for his life. And then at his parole hearing, he has these all these random stories, including that he just fell on grass. They're showing how... They actually brought the lawnmower there and showing how impossible it would have been to have even done what he had said. And then they bring that up as part of the appeal that the lawnmower was manipulated. It's it's so funny. This is as good of an appeal. Can you imagine being a public defender and having to take on clients, the worst type of monsters, but then also like narcissistic, you know, sociopaths that are in complete denial and don't see how the world perceives them and you have to defend them. It's like, God, what a, what a, what a hard job. Who graduates law school and then finds themselves in that situation? I just, I don't get it. And then to and then someone has to even write an appeal like this. How do you write an appeal knowing that it's so ridiculous and that it would never in a million years get approved? How do you type it out? How do you do that? Um it's got to be one of the hard it's like it's like having a job where you have to move your job every day is to go and take a pile of bricks, pick it up and move it Pick it back up when you're done and move it back. Or like dig a ditch, then fill the ditch. And dig the ditch and fill a ditch. It's, it, the, same, it's the same ditch. It's, it's meaningless. There's no end. There's no purpose. And I don't, it's got to just be awful. Like I get the idea of I just how do you, how do you wake up and just do that? It's got to be just awful. Anyways, that's it from my venting. Love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, please do the YouTube thing. It really does help. And with that, I'll let you go.